Hey everybody, so I'm here to review a little bit about what we learned already about the industrial age in America and then I'm also going to teach you the topics that I would have taught you in class again. So if you recall we started with the industrial economy and we started discussing what were the changes in industry that made businesses and industry grow in America around the late 19th century. So if you recall, we looked at this chart and we realized that America's business was expanding because at the same time that railroads and farms were growing, it was generally improving the quality of life for a few people. And so this set of changes puts together kind of a chain reaction that makes uh, conditions really well for businesses to start growing in America. So we looked at this painting of the Bessemer process, the steel production process. And then we started discussing the rise of railroads and the rise of the national market. So we looked at this image already and we sort of figured out that by mid-1890, by 1885, most of the rails were already laid across the country. And this is thousands of miles between 1830 and 1975. We also established that railroad corporations were so powerful that they somehow lobbied the American government so that they could create these time zones in order to make things more efficient for themselves, in order to make uh, transportation of goods from one side of the country to another really, really quick. So we briefly discussed the innovation and competition part, and I did mention to you that in this image, for example, the United States is portrayed as this Uncle Sam character over here that's in some ways selling goods to all these other countries. Well, that's still true here, and what I didn't mention in class is that a lot of these companies in the United States started forming these things called trusts, and, and these corporations sort of got together and in order to prevent one business from kind of uh, not doing well, they all sort of pulled together most of their assets and they became trusts. So this era is also known as the era of trusts. And for a lot of businesses, this was a really good thing because it made them kind of safe from failure. And in, in a lot of other ways, it made them really, really powerful to the point that they became things like monopolies. And so the competition part is related here to Mr. Thomas Edison, which is pictured here in his lab with a bunch of his employees. One thing you need to understand is that people like him are innovators that start to thrive or get better because there's more competition in the market. And so the more competition, the more they motivate you to make things better. So he made a bunch of inventions in his lifetime, including the, the phonograph, the, uh, the incandescent light bulb, which we now know as simply the light bulb. And this is one aspect of competition. Now, in today's lecture, I would have talked about the captains of industry. Now, I put a question mark here because I need to define something here. Some historians think about people like the following, like Andrew Carnegie, as either a captain of industry, and some historians know them as Robert Behrens. And here's the distinction. You call them captains of industry if you're generally in the belief that they got rich because they were really good at what they did, and because they got an opportunity that not a lot of people had, and because they took advantage of that opportunity, and they made themselves rich. And because of that wealth, they sort of improved the way that our country worked. That's the captain of industry point of view. Now, the robber baron point of view is that these people got rich based off of the hard work and labor of poor people, and they never sort of thank these poor people. They sort of just kind of brushed them off and took advantage of them. Now, whether you think one or the other is correct, you need to understand that there's these two sides. And so Andrew Carnegie is a good example of this. Because Andrew Carnegie, later in his life when he became really wealthy, he got wealthy, first of all, off of this corporation he called U.S. Steel. And as you can see from this image here, U.S. Steel had a very large influence on the kind of north uh, part of our country. And it produced the majority of steel by the end of the 19th century in the United States and actually in, in the world. And so he got really rich at this point, but he started to give some of that wealth back. He started to kind of engage in this activity we call philanthropy. And philanthropy is basically when you use all the riches and all the wealth that you've made in your lifetime to sort of spread it out and make society better. So this is actually something that you're going to read about in a document we're going to read in class. Now, this sort of spurred an idea in the United States that innovation was good for America, that, that the country is better because of innovation. So in paintings like this one, you started to see kind of a, a push for more um, positive views of business and industry in America. So this is kind of like the, the rise of how America becomes known as its own identity as a big business country. Now, the landscape of America is actually changing because now for the first time, for example, 
light bulbs are everywhere. So now you start seeing light or electricity in certain cities. And that changes the perspective of a lot of people because now people can work, for example, all, all the way to the late hours of the night because now there's light bulbs and there's electricity. So you can beat the sun and you can actually uh, use this electric power to still conduct your business. Now, with this growth come some consequences, and here's some of them. Um, as you can see in this image, companies like Standard Oil are, are being criticized by cartoonists like this one here. This cartoon is called Next. And in this cartoon, the artist decides to portray Standard Oil, the company, as an octopus. And it has its tentacles all around things like the US Congress and the White House. Now, this kind of image is, is sort of to uh, be interpreted as a company that's kind of out of control and that is taking too much influence. So this influence is actually pretty visible because at the turn of the century, things like country clubs are, are, are becoming more and more popular for the richest Americans. So the 1% of Americans that can afford this start to kind of use their wealth to, to sort of enjoy things in life that they did not have access to before. You got to think about it this way. You work all day. You rarely have time for leisure. Well, these rich people have a lot of time for leisure, and they generally like to spend their money in these ways. They, they kind of go to these country clubs here. This means that America is becoming more and more unequal, and this increasing inequality is displayed in several ways. One of the most prominent ways is that the majority of immigrants that came to America tended to live in these areas called slums. And this is a photograph from a, a progressive photographer. His name was Jacob Reese. And in the early 19 teens, he went out to uh, New York City and he started taking photographs of all these poor people to show the upper half of the country how the poor half lives. He actually called the slideshow that he put together, he called it How the Other Half Lives. And this is something that is showing for the first time the realities of this big rise of industry and this big rise of business in America. And there's this novel that's published around the same time called Sunshine and Shadow. And as you can see, it shows this really big kind of luxurious mansion on the top. And then it shows the slums where the majority of workers tend to live in the central business district on the bottom in the shadows. And so this is a look at how industry sort of rose in America and what are the consequences of this rise and of this growth. I hope this helps. So this is going to be the short analytical paragraph for this chapter, for chapter 16. And it's a very simple question. It's asking you what caused the growth of industry and big business. And then it's asking you what were the consequences of this growth. Good luck.